Okay, maybe we'll make a start again. Looking at the work of Magritte. Uh, uh, starting off by showing you a work called Modern, 1923. Uh, an example of his pre-surrealist work. Um, the artist that we're starting to look at now, Magritte and Dali, both artists who come to surrealism after it exists as a style, as it exists as a movement, and they're responding to something that, that's already there, whereas artists like Miro and Ernst were surrealists before there was surrealism. They're kind of and then the movement is being applied to them as a, as, as a label, a help, or they, you could say they're helping to define what that label might mean in visual terms. So it's a slightly different phenomenon. So here is Magritte kind of involved with a kind of slightly, you might want to call it a kind of purist style, um, something in a post-cubist vein that's uh, distilled down, very simplified. So he only becomes a surrealist in style after the first surrealist manifesto was published. He's a Belgian artist, comes to Paris as an outsider, not particularly close to the circle of Breton and the, uh, you know, the core surrealists. Well, this is uh, early surrealist work by Magritte, The Menaced Assassin, 1926. It's relatively unusual compared to his later works in that there is something of a, a narrative dimension to it. Something has happened, something seems about to happen. A murder has taken place, but the the murderer or the presumed murderer is very nonchalantly playing a gramophone record on an old style gramophone, quite untroubled by the violence that must have taken place very much earlier, uh, just a little earlier, and completely unaware it seems that he's been watched from behind by these three strange sort of witnesses, plus uh, the fact that he's about to be captured and probably in a rather violent way by the two figures in the foreground that we can see that he can't see. So there's something, yeah, almost sort of theatrical or cinematic perhaps about it. He, he liked these um, detective stories. There were th this uh, series of films starring the uh, character Fantomas, uh, who, who he, 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 he rather liked. Um, so, yeah, not just purely painting sources may be playing into his work. There's this, this part of what is strange about the work is not just the, this disjunction between the activity that has taken place, a murderer, a murder and the the mood of the figures, but also a strange sort of doubling, you know, of the two figures, one on either side, that look almost the same, dressed in the same rather formal way, or the tripling of the figures behind, that strange sort of redundancy that's in introduced. On the Threshold of Liberty, 1929. So a typical sort of surrealist titles. The title doesn't explain and pin down meaning. It elaborates and opens up meaning, adds another dimension of poetry to it. It's pretty clear uh, that De Chirico is a major source for um, the work of Magritte, as it is for so many of the surrealists. You know, we saw that for Ernst. The same will be true for 
Dali and for Tangi as well. Well, uh, paintings within paintings we saw in de Chirico's work, and we have that kind of feeling here, one image within another, Im uh, another image, compartmentalization as a way of bringing different realities together, juxtaposing different realities within the same image. Or even when de Chirico is not doing that through juxtaposing images within images, he, he finds ways of putting things together that are not normally found together, and that's something we've, we have here. Uh, sometimes in de Chirico's painting you get this sort of obsessive symbolism, so you have these sort of phallic kind of tower symbols, and here we have a, an obvious sort of phallic uh, symbol of the gun pointing exactly towards the naked female figure, which kind of underlines the, that kind of phallic or yin-yang yin -yang dimension to it all. Adds another sense to the painting. What is a big military gun like that doing in an interior space anyway? That doesn't belong indoors. We seem to be indoors. What is outside? Well, it's hard to say. Maybe we can't tell what's outside. Maybe everything that is visible here is just an image. And what is outside is something we, we can't know. Alternatively, perhaps, you know, this is a, a window and what we're in a room and outside across the street there is a, 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 another room rather like this uh, behind each of these windows. Or maybe it's the sky that is the, the real world. Or maybe we're in the countryside. We can't quite say. Certainly, this doesn't seem to be where we are. What the heck this is? We have no idea what that is, right? That's not, that starts to be something we don't even know what the hell it is. Um, so, complicated. Isn't it something about the world and our images of it? You know, in, in our mind, we, we, we have images of what the world is like, but do we know really what it is like? So it, with Magritte, you often have this sort of interior-exterior uh, contrast, the sky indoors. But you know, is our image of the world the same as what the world is? Can we assume that? Where are our images of the world? Are they inside our head? You know, is the world that we think of the world as out there, but is it actually in here? Uh, th this is a sort of philosophical worry in a way. Magritte's uh, a very philosophical painter. Well, or where are our thoughts? Are our, th are our thoughts in our head? Is our mind in our body? You know, do does it make sense to think of a thought as being somewhere? A thought doesn't have uh, extension. It doesn't have weight. If you added all the thoughts you'd ever thought in your life together and put them in a scales, how much would they weigh? Zero, because they're not things in a world. You know, so maybe we can't think of uh, thoughts as, as being in or outside anything. Does it make sense to think of the mind as being inside the body? What would that mean? All these sort of issues are, are ones that maybe Magritte is trying to uh, play around with interior and exterior. So like de Chirico, most of his works are made up of things which are just ordinary everyday things. In fact, the same ordinary everyday things can come back again and again in his work. It's But, but the ordinary world is somehow made strange to us without the introduction of fantasy or anything. The first uh, painting he became aware of by de Chirico was this one, the, the Song of Love. He considered de Chirico the greatest painter of our time, and he felt that this painting dealt with poetry's ascendancy over painting, you know, the sort of literary poetic feeling 
jumping ahead in time to make a point by showing your work of McGreek from 1952 called Personal Values. I'll go back to look at some earlier works, but by jumping to this later work, I'm trying to make the point that there is very little by way of stylistic development in his work. You know, works from different periods have pretty much the same ingredients to them. So here again you have the, the sky indoors, you know, exterior and interior blurred. He worked for a while, a short while, in a factory making wallpaper. So, you know, this, this theme of kind of wallpaper it sort of reappears a lot. Maybe wallpaper is not so popular nowadays, you know, it's rather a, a fairly unusual thing now. Most pe people will, uh, will just paint walls. Uh, but at a certain point in time, it was very popular. Um, and wallpaper, if you think about it, could be a rather f funny thing. You know, I mean, I, I once, when I was in London, moved into a rented flat, and one of the rooms in the fl flat had a wallpaper which we quickly painted over, but it was uh, a design of a leopard skin, a leopard skin pattern on a black background. No, but so what is that saying to you? It's like saying, here I am, I'm on the inside of the outside of a leopard, or you know, well, it's, it's kind of a really bizarre idea if you try and think of what the, what it is trying to say to you. Anyway, uh, wallpaper can have some sort of funny meanings like that to it, you know, to, if you pay attention to it. Or just a, a very a very simple meaning could be, you're indoors, but this is a lovely flowery pattern or something. It's as if you're out in a, a meadow full of flowers, something like that. And that's an idea, that kind of interior exterior idea is a sort of basic one that Magritte is playing with here. Well, apart from the wallpaper, um, sure, yeah, of course he's playing with scale. I suppose you could come up with a, a, a rational explanation for the strange scale. You could say, oh, maybe this is like a, a doll's house. Okay, we'll have to find some explanation for why the doll's house has this strange wallpaper. But apart from that, it's, uh, you know, maybe it's a doll's house. It's not in use anymore, so some household items have got sto stored in it or something like that. But. Um, yeah, trying to make out of everyday things. This is a shaving, old-style shaving brush, comb, soap, a match. Uh, out of out of everyday objects, something strange because of the the juxtaposition at the the the, the change of scale. So. Maybe we're meant to come away from it thinking that those everyday objects are somehow more strange. Maybe we need to recover a sense of the wonder at the world. We get so used to the routines of our everyday life that we take the wonder of life, of being alive. You know, oh, here I am in class again, you know, another day, more boring, whatever. It, but no, here it is. We're alive. Life is a fantastic thing that didn't have to happen but it is happening and here we are here and now alive enjoying it you know and isn't that amazing you know it's amazing that this thing which includes us is happening you know which didn't have to happen you know so we we need to recover the sense of how how strange it is that there is you and I you know that uh, here we are and uh, you know Magritte is here to help us to remember, remember it's all fantastic, it's all wonderful, it's all s strange and uh, any rational explanation will only help you a certain way towards, um, you know, taming that and uh, neatly pigeonholing it away somewhere.
So he talks about attempting to shock. He says, my interest lay entirely in provoking an emotional shock. Well, that's a typical surrealist strategy, and Dada also liked to do things that were shocking. Um, it's a little bit different, say, from what Ernst would do. You know, you could, there, in, if we take those earlier, more realistic paintings by Max Ernst, uh, he, he's more about telling you about his unconscious. You know, he, the, a painting like Oedipus Rex, he's trying to evoke a sense of... Uh, unconscious conflicts, maybe his own, maybe to provoke our sense of our own unconscious. I don't think that's what Magritte is doing, not in most of his works. Uh, I think it's more a sort of, there, there isn't much about Magritte's unconscious life here. I think he's, he's, he's calculatingly creating a certain effect that will you know, produce a certain shock in us. I make with things known the unknown. Actually, there's a connection with Ernst that he did see Ernst's collages. You know, I said uh, the, those early Surrealist paintings by Ernst are based a little bit on his own collages, but actually those collages were also seen by Magritte. So the, the putting together of different things at different scales, collage could help you with that. So a work like this is all part of the story of the influence of collage in a way. You, you cut one thing out and put it into an image and it's of a different scale from the other things. Um, Klaus Oldenburg, an example of a later artist who liked to play with scale. So you know, just to tell you what Magritte's influence might be on, who he sometimes thought of as a pop artist, a pop sculptor, like ordinary clothes peg, but uh, a domestic item made into a large-scale public sculpture in a corporate environment. And I, I think it's also a little art historical joke to, in the history of sculpture because you know one, what is the one of the most famous modern modernist sculptures would be Brancusi's Kiss, and this is a little bit like you know a kiss, kissing and hugging kind of imagery. The human condition. Back to Magritte. I think he, he, there's a lot of these works with about the theme of interior and exterior, where you have the, the you know, uh, is the concern again is between the world and our internal representations of it, our mental images of it, and also I suppose it's a it's a a debate about art and artistic representation and reality, and I suppose more narrowly in that sense a critique of real realist notions the idea that art can just capture the world here yeah the landscape does seem to match reality uh, but we know that's just because the reality is also just a painting too <laughs> uh, because we're look the whole thing is a painting um, and anyway, we don't know what the, whatever is behind this canvas is blocking our access to the world rather than revealing the world. Uh, so we just we can trust it if we like, but we might be foolish to do so. We don't know that there is a tree here in the landscape. Just because it says so in the painting doesn't mean that there, there will be one. So paintings as creating a, a blindness or blocking our access to the world rather than uh, revealing the world. The image is, is inside, but it's about what is outside. This is Magritte talking anyway about this theme in his art, which comes back uh, again and again. The problem of the window led to the human condition. In front of a window, as seen from the interior of a room, I placed a picture that represented precisely the portion of landscape blotted out by the picture. For instance, the tree 
represented in the picture displace the tree situated behind it outside the room for the spectator. It was simultaneously inside the room in the picture and outside in the real landscape in thought, which is how we see the world, namely outside of us, though having only the representation of it within us. So we're concerned with perceptual and conceptual problems the disjunction between art and reality, language and reality, uh, are concerns for him. Well, here's another variation on that theme, Euclidean walks, 1955. Well, just a little odd thing that uh, the perspective of the road <laughs> doubles the perspective of the, uh, the, the shape of the tower. One is going back in depth, one is just becoming smaller in a single plane. Well, this is the basic idea, and then this is kind of a little extra game on top of that. Here the image is not on an easel, it's on the actual window. We thought we were looking through the window at the scene, but actually it turns out it was uh, just a, an image on the, on the window. Luckily it does seem to be similar, but anyway. We take images of all realities. Or perhaps uh, his most famous image, this is not a pipe. Sassini Pazum Peep. The title is The Treason of Images, 1928 to 29. Images can rise up against us, we can't uh, keep them within our power. Well, the, the, the words and images are working against each other. Uh, the image says pipe, and the inscription says not a pipe. <laughs> you know, it's like these little um, you know, logical puzzles. Um, I think uh, if I say the next statement is true, and I say the previous statement is false. You know, well, one doesn't, one undermines the other. Or Pinocchio, he's famous, if he tells a lie, his nose grows. Uh, what if Pinocchio says, uh, my nose will grow now? Well, if his nose was growing, <laughs> that means he told a lie, but then he said his nose would grow, so he must be telling the truth. So this is a kind of verbal visual equivalent to those kind of logical puzzles, you could say. It, it's all part of his undermining of realism. A image of a pipe is not a pipe. Or pipe is just a word, a sound, pipe, you know, what is, what is a, it's not a, a thing. You can't smoke an image of a pipe. Anyway, this is not a pipe. What, uh, this is vague. What does this refer to, anyway? This. What is the, the this that is being referred to? It's all, you know, everything starts to unravel if you, if you look too, too closely at everything. <coughs> Words sort of tie reality down give it, put a label on it. The writing here is like, almost like a sort of childlike writing, you know, it's like a, the, the world of the primary school classroom where everything is labelled and makes sense and complications have, have not yet emerged. All these philosophical conundrums are not yet part of what we were considering. 
we may even in a primary school classroom you may the teacher may even put up little labels to tell you the, what the word for things you door might be written on the door so you learn the word door everything is like ne neatly you know, table you know, everything is uh, clear cut but now in the Greeks uh, world all that those certainties start to to unravel again so it's another route towards the marvelous or another way of creating a sense of um, the limitations of realism instead of breaking it down through using a cubist uh, vocabulary you can be uh, as in Magritte is a sort of secret agent working within realism that ultimately undermines it there are some works he produces which have this quality of um, you know, the fantastical about them. Sh sh boots which are also feet. This is the Red Model 1936. And there are some works where I think it would be easy to talk about them in more psychoanalytic terms. Uh, this is the, the Lovers of 1928. Uh, it's often been pointed out that uh, there, well, there are many of these works where faces are hidden in one way or another, as they are here, and uh, sometimes an object is in front of the face, uh, like an apple floating in space or something like that. And this kind of work is being related to an uh, event uh, of his biography where that his mother committed suicide by drowning, and when her body was brought out, her, her, her clothing had sort of come covered her face uh, and, and supposedly Magritte was there when it happened so it could be a sort of some kind of dealing with trauma but it, it also works at another level of just uh, trying to make the familiar unfamiliar the most familiar thing perhaps to us human beings is the face of a human being uh, we're so used to reading human faces it's a little bit like the artists Christo and Jean-Claude, you know, you, they take an everyday thing, a building, cover it to make it seem strange for a while. So, uh, you know, veiling, making invisible. Remember we, we, when we were looking at Dada, we looked at the work of Man Ray, the enigma of Isidore Ducasse, you know, covering a sewing machine. Um, to, to make it invisible. Not to be reproduced, 1932. Well, mirror reflecting a back rather than a front. But isn't it just as strange that mirrors reflect fronts in a way? I mean, the, the, we, we get used to the laws of nature as they are, but you know, they, it could be that the laws of nature are different. were different, you know. It's sort of strange that they are the, you know, gravity is a very strange thing, you know, that every object attracts in the universe, attracts every other object. Isn't that a strange idea, you know, it's, if you think about it? Well, we accept it because it's, it involves us all, all our lives, so we become used to the idea, but it's strange. Everything is attracting everything at every moment. Why do mirrors reflect... Why do mirrors reverse left and right, but not top and bottom? You know, all those lots of things that are strange. Wait, but isn't the book reflected in the right direction? Ah, good point. Uh, so, is it? I can't quite make it out. Yeah. 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 It's symmetrical. It looks. It looks. It looks uh, that it fits in with the. Yeah, yeah, with what you would normally expect from a mirror. Yeah, so even the mirror is paradoxical in that sense. There are some things you could, you could. There are certain words you could write and hold up in front of a mirror, and it would appear not to reverse, because uh, it's kind of, a, of the shape of the letters or something. But I don't think this w uh, that would uh, ex explain this one.
the rape, 1934. Well, I, it's, a, it's very different style, but it's a little bit like what Miro was doing, where he confuses facial features and genital features. He did it in his own symbolic vocabulary, in a work like Personages in the Night, but here is uh, Magritte doing the same thing in a kind of a sort of realist way. Collective Invention, 1935, a sort of reverse mermaid, paradoxical kind of object. I once uh, saw in a kind of like a, a market in tai Taipei, uh, this image having been re-photographed uh, so that it starts to look like a photograph rather than a paint photograph of a painting. And it was presented as like a sort of a, a photo of a marvelous thing, you know, as if it really happened in the world. For a short time, um, Magritte does uh, ban abandon this signature style of his and, and adopt this, this kind of style, which is you could say is a kind of uh, parody of late Renoir, except where in late Renoir it would be a female nude, whereas in his case it's a male nude. I think that's enough about him. Let, let's move on to Dali, um, a, again a late arrival to surrealism. And uh, he was actually one of the people most responsible for turning surrealism away from automatism, which Breton had emphasized in the first Surrealist Manifesto, and towards illusionism as a, a, a tool, the hand-painted dream picture. I think Breton didn't quite like the way the surrealist artists were using automatism as a tool for making better art rather than as a goal in itself for just revealing the unconscious for its own sake. Uh, so he started to think maybe another uh, method might be suitable. So this is uh, Dali's portrait of his father, 1925. And then this is um, an example of his early Surrealist work and one of his most famous works altogether, The Persistence of Memory of 1931, where you have this sense of the dilation of time, almost like a, you might experience in a dream, represented through his famous melting clocks. The clock, you know, you only have a sensation of softness because Clocks aren't, are not normally soft. Landscape setting very common for him. Yeah, as with um, other surrealist artists you, and with De Chirico, you have certain obsessive imagery uh, returning from work to work. The, the, the idea of the, the strangeness of something that is normally hard represented as soft. It, again, that's something that Klaus Oldenburg uh, picks up in, in, in his work. So, yeah, this is his Floor Cake, 1962. Uh, one of the first artists to use soft materials to make sculpture from. Back to Dali. Illumined Pleasures, 1929. In this work, there's actually some collaged elements, although the collage element is very well integrated. You don't n think of it as being collaged. It's one, one smaller work where you can see a surrealist artist's depth to De Chirico coming through. The images within an image is very much a De Chirico thing. Uh, a, a sort of s a statue, that's something you might, on a Plint, that's something you might see in De Chirico, even though it wouldn't look like that. Sharp uh, shadows, that's a De Chirico thing. 
yeah, the shadow of something that you can't see, the thing itself. That's the, the Kirika. He talks about deliberately trying to mimic some of the states of, uh, of, of madness, you know, a kind of parody or kind of a, a parody the, the state of mind of someone suffering mental illness in order to, to access the unconscious. He says, I believe that the moment is near when where by a procedure of active paranoiac thought it will be possible to systematize confusion and contribute to the total discrediting of the world of reality. Well, yeah, so he's using realistic te techniques, but like Magritte, it's a sort of undermining of it from within. Realism doesn't mean truthfulness, and in the face of uh, an artist like Magritte or Dali, that becomes clear because they show things which really couldn't be the case. How much of the unconscious is here is hard to say because um, a problem comes up that you know uh, once you're talking about an art artist making art who knows about Freud's theory, then the whole thing could be rather conscious, you know. And, and Freud himself immediately picked this up when Dali went to to, to talk to him. Um, uh, Freud basically said, I'm more interested in your conscious mind than your unconscious mind, you know. He picked up that, that there is this very conscious dimension in what Dali is doing. Yeah, so just to remind you of, of, of Di Chirico, this is his metaphysical interior with large factory, 1916 to 17, the idea of images within images which Dali has picked up. Giraffe of Flame, 1935. Uh, well, I'll just go through quickly to the next image. Premonition of Civil War, soft construction with baked beans, 1936. So the, the date is important. It's again one of the works produced during the, the time of the Spanish Civil War. The fragmented figure, it, it, it makes me think of um, that same, in fact, that same Picasso uh, bather that I showed you when we were talking about Miro, that, those kind of um, figures. It's a realist style, but it's hard to imagine it without those kind of modernist experimentations. Autumn cannibalism, again, 1936. So again, this context is the Spanish Civil War. Two people eating each other. Well, that's, that's a good metaphor for, for this particular nature of civil war. But I think the image works on more than one level. It's also about romantic love, the, the kind of devouring nature of, of uh, erotic desire or something like that. You know, the, the actually not just even erotic desire. I mean, it's a common thing to say about a baby. Oh, the, ba the baby is so pretty. I could eat it up or something like that. There's kind of the oral incorporative nature of uh, of desire. Um, he even gives you an autobiographical uh, dimension to this in his, in his own autobiography. He describes when he first met his, uh, first kissed his wife, Gala, and he says, and this first kiss touched only the fringe of that li libidinous famine that made us bite and eat I was eating that mouth whose blood already mingled with mine. So a sort of sense of uh, 
of mer yeah I, another way of thinking about it emerging with the loved object you know the, the a relationship you can feel you're losing your identity in a relationship you know, so close or so uh, you know in need of the other you're sort of overwhelmed by them so all, uh, this is as good a way as any t to try and deal with that or the the way that love and aggression can uh, kind of get sort of tied up together. Metamorphosis of Narcissus, 1934. Well, I think most people know the story of Narcissus, uh, who's made by the by the gods to fall in love with his own reflection in the surface of water which he could never capture every time he touched the water he disturbed the image destroying it but then he was taken pity on and turned into the Narcissus flower gaining a sort of immortality so here you see this sort of doubling so yeah playing with uh, visual um, illusions and so forth transformation is occurring almost in front of our eyes from one thing to another in a static image a transformation can nevertheless occur sleep 1937 almost I, I, I sort of think of this as uh, you know trying to say well, how could you make an image of the experience of falling off into sleep? You know, when you're asleep, you're not experiencing anything, so you can't make an uh, image of that. What would what would it sleep be like? But um, maybe the the experience of you you sort of dissolve away into sleep, into nothingness. Uh, is it something like that that you you're, you're trying to stay awake? Mm. Mm. That kind of the ver ver edge experiences of human consciousness, where it disappears into nothingness, and you know our ordinary everyday uh, selves, uh, ego, doesn't um, even recognise that we disappear every night, you know, and then reappear every morning. We sort of somehow uh, don't um, worry about those sort of gaps. We, you know, we, we manage to sort of forget that there are those gaps in our experience, but you know, maybe we want to specify it. Um, yeah. Aphrodisiac jacket. So he made certain kind of objects as well as images. Telephone receiver in the form of a lobster. Yeah. So since it, it, it you know, uh, uh, artists like Magritte will use everyday objects in his paintings to change our attitude to them. But how about you actually change objects around you, something you take for granted, like a phone, um, you know, can be transformed. Well, very briefly, because we're already over time. Um, Tangi, he is a very narrow artist in a sense, but it, it, interesting nevertheless. He's one of the early surrealist, often having these sort of sharp shadows, which you could say is de Chirico-like, um, strange, almost human uh, reference, but it's made up out of organic forms or even sort of stony kind of forms. He came from uh, a place on the French coast where you, you have these prehistoric stone standing stones. Karnak. And he presents them in this open landscape space, almost like a kind of abstract sculpture, but never actually worked in 3D himself. Influential on some sculptors like Noguchi, the Japanese American sculptor. Both he and Picasso make. 2D images of sculpture, which they never produce 3D images of. André Masson, automatic drawing from 1926. Well, this is a good example of 
trying to produce an, uh, an image just by rapid scribbling and then see what kind of images em emerge. And he produced a number of these things, but he found it hard to translate it into three dimensions. Um, he, he ended using a kind of quasi-cubist vocabulary in his painting a lot of the time. and. Um, doing things like here, he's introducing sand into the painting that helps to introduce some kind of random uh, event. This is his Battle of Fishes of 1926. Well, just to finish, Andre, uh, sorry, Mata, um, he was a Chilean artist, actually trained as an architect, came to Paris, later relocated to New York, although. Within the story of Surrealism, sometimes he, he's, a, he's a very late joiner to the Surrealist movement, but he's important in connecting it through to the next major movement of art, the uh, post uh, wartime and post-war American abstract expressionists. Uh, part of his importance is his own art because it starts to move towards abstraction and fluidity uh, that's more suitable as an influence on, on them. He was very close to the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, very close to the artist uh, Ashio Gorky, influenced him. Uh, but it's also that he, just that he could speak English. And uh, a lot of those uh, um, French speaking uh, surrealists did uh, escape uh, to New York, but because their English wasn't that good, they didn't have a high level of interaction with the American artists. But Matter was one of the people who helped to explain surrealism to the Americans and therefore have, have an influence on them. So, um, yeah, this sort of non-Euclidean space, it's not a sort of perspectival space, it's a kind of broken up kind of um, uh, twisted space. He's very interested in mathematical models and things like that. Uh, and it, it becomes a way of uh, creating a uh, uh, an imagery of the of, of psychic space of the interior life uh, and come becoming increasingly abstract. He went back more to s s more figurative work in his later life, but um, he, he's uh, perhaps more influential in this earlier phase. Okay, I think we we better stop there. We're running up over time, so thank you very much, and uh, I'm looking forward very much to your essays uh, in due course, you all know the deadline and you all know that you need to submit a copy to the turn it in the, uh, the digital version as well, right? You have all those details in emails from me at various points. So yeah, let me know if you're having any problems with the development of your essay, the writing of your essay. I'll be happy to help. <laughs>